everyone, if you followed along with us on the buzz, then you've toured all across Will County, exploring the forest preserves while learning about the nature and history and special projects along the way. Well, today we're going to take you to a federally owned land. And the best part is we don't have to travel far because Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie is located right in our backyard. We'll be exploring the history of the land, restoration, the habitat, and of course, the bison that call Medewin home. In fact, there's so much to cover, we're going to do this in two episodes. Get ready to hit the road and enjoy part one on this episode of The Buzz. National Tallgrass Prairie is over 18,000 acres located near Elwood and Wilmington along Illinois Route 53. It's pretty huge. Imagine taking all of Will County preserves and shoving them into one place. That's about how big Medewin is. And it's gone through many transformations from being farmland to a World War II ammunition plant to becoming the first National Tallgrass Prairie in the United States. And today there's plenty to do, like hiking and biking, even horseback riding. Plus, don't forget to view the incredible flora and fauna. Let's start with Medewin. Where did this name come from? Okay, so the Medewin is a Potawatomi word, and it means Grand Medicine Society. Okay, and they were and are still in existence um, in many of the Anishinaabek people. Okay, so um, they are a healing force within the Potawatomi, and their goal is to cre create balance in the Potawatomi society. So in wanting to heal the land here, we consulted with the Potawatomi in mm -hmm. 1995 and 1996 to see if it was okay. We didn't just appropriate right. the name. <laughs> and um, so that's why we have Medewin. What a nice, like, restoring name for a beautiful place like this where you can get all that energy still today. Now let's talk more about those Native Americans. Who all called this place home? Okay, so if we go back, um, they have evidence as far as 10,000 years ago that they have found that people were here, but they presume that about maybe a couple thousand years before that people mm -hmm. were here. Um, there are over 100 sites that show that people were here. Currently, um, they have done work with Notre Dame on one site. Um, the people there, they don't even have a name for them. Um, they were probably here about the early 1600s, about 60 or so years before Marquette um, was here. Um, and uh, so that's the one site that's being investigated most recently. Um, north, in the woods north of Medewin, um, the Potawatomi um, had encampments, and um, 1832 was when the Black Hawk War happened. Mm -hmm. Most of the pioneers that were settling this area moved to a safer location. They left everything, including animals. And the Potawatomi at that time with Chief Chabonel were very friendly and their animals were taken care of while they were gone. Some of them were gone for weeks, some of mm -hmm. them were gone for months. And not, you know, this was in the summer that this happened and we're not back until spring planting. So the animals were taken care of while they were gone. So I think that's a pretty- What kind of animals were left behind? Are we talking uh, like dogs or are we talking oh, cattle? We're talking anything, uh, cattle, sheep, uh, you know, sheep, the uh, pigs, horses, whatever oh, wow. livestock they mm -hmm. had. So they were taken care of. Excellent. We talked about the groups that were before living here, Native Americans and some even before that. Picture 200 years ago, we're walking through beautiful flowers, tall grasses. Is this what it looked like back then? It's getting there. Um, give it a hundred more years and we're gonna mm -hmm. be a little bit closer. Um, this area here is about 50 acres and it was planted by contractors but also volunteers and children. School groups helped cool. plant us. So plugs were put in the ground here as well as a lot of seed. Mm -hmm. um, in the end about uh, 20,000 plugs were put into this area and it's reseeded itself and we've added seed so it would be close. Okay. Um, this time of year it would normally be taller. We've had mm -hmm. less rain. Sure. Um, it's said that a man on horseback wouldn't be seen going through the prairie. Now wow. granted, that wouldn't be in the spring. <laughs> that would be later in the wow. year. Um, but Eliza Steele uh, was a writer 
it came out west to the wild west of Illinois in 1840. Mm -hmm. And um, she came all the way from Buffalo. We traced, our archaeologists and our Heritage Society, traced her movements through the Chicago area into Ottawa. And um, they wanted to see if the road still existed. They wanted to see if her diary, her journal was exact, yeah. was the time of day, because she, she gave a lot of information. She talked about a lot of plants. Now the plants, she wasn't so sure on. Mm -hmm. She made guesses. Yeah. But the roads still exist. There's only cool. a very small segment that isn't there anymore. So you can follow that. And we have that on our app. Okay. So you can follow what they did and what they explored. Uh -huh. And maybe, you won't be here. Yeah. Well, that's the funny part. <laughs> right. you, you only get to be about, in the yeah. You but... only get about to I-80 and 55, mm -hmm. but it would have all been prairie. Right, there. but this is what a good look yes. of it would be. So she would have been traveling by carriage and seeing all this seeing moving past her and trying to guess what this flower is and what that flower is. And she made some good guesses and our botanist has made some equally good guesses of <laughs> what she probably did yeah. see. Yeah, I mean, if you're not a flower person, there's a lot of colors out here. There there's are. different shades of yellow, there's different types, there's And it depends on the time of, of year you come too. In the spring, it's a kind of a sleepy time and plants sure. are waking up, uh, but after that, it starts changing week by week. The height go grows. By midsummer, it's at its zenith, mm -hmm. and then into the fall, we get the yellows and the purples yeah, and the, the grasses. Asters, I'm sure. Oh are yes, my favorite. yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and the grasses are moving and swaying, and that's my favorite time of year. It's a different sort of color than trees, but they're still color, mm -hmm. and you hear the movement. Yeah more of a sensory kind it is of walk. it is definitely and you also get the smells if you've never been out on a prairie we're getting a different smell today because it's cool mm -hmm. on hot days you get another smell it's a wonderful thing to be in the middle of the prairie going down our timeline Mendewin also has a rich farmstead history there's still ruins here today that we're going to learn more about Siobhan kind of talked us through the Native Americans and what it looked like on the land when they were here. And now we've kind of ushered in this new era with farmsteads. Can you kind of give us a picture of what that might have looked like? Yeah, well, it probably would have been prairie out here. These trees wouldn't have been present. And I picture standing in, like right here and seeing wagons coming in from the east, you know, always, yeah. always heading further and further west. And we're at one of these historical sites. What was this used to be? This used to be, this farm set was owned by, uh, his name was Elias Reed. He was the son of Charles Reed, who was considered the father of Joliet. It was okay. a farm set. There's a house here. We have a, a barn over this way and all okay. the other outbuildings. So who lived here before the property then turned to the arsenal? The Schumacher family leased this property from the early 1920s up until 1940 when the arsenal came in. A couple of the children still come out here to give tours. They're in their 90s. You know. it's wow. A fascinating talk. And when the arsenal came to town, did they have to move or how did that work out? Did they just sign they, it over? Yes, they had, uh, everyone had to, evet to uh, leave the area, given up to like 90 days. Okay. And in some instances, including this, particular farm set, the house was actually picked up and moved oh, further wow. south. And then there's other sites too. I hear there's cemeteries here. Yes, we have like six cemeteries on us. Are these sites open to the public? A couple of them are open to the public, but most of them are in the off-limit areas, mm -hmm. still owned by the Army. This doesn't look like much, but it comes with a story. Yes, they did have a dairy operation here. They'd milk the cows, they'd bring the milk out and put it in here. And I had a windmill constantly pumping cool water over the milk, keeping it cool, cool until the truck picked it up. So it looks like we're on just a grass trail, but there's more to it than just being a trail. It was an old town road? Yes, yeah, this used to be a township road. It was actually Blodgett Road. The Jackson Township on the north side, Florence Township on the south side. Let's take a moment for a commercial break, but when we get back, we'll learn more about Medewin.
The benefits are great when you invest in nature by donating to the Nature Foundation of Will County. You can help protect our precious habitats and restore natural areas back to their native state. Provide educational opportunities to unlock the natural world for present and future generations. Support diversity and inclusion so everyone can experience the magnificence of nature. The Nature Foundation works hand in hand with the Forest Preserve District of Will County to strengthen the commitment to land stewardship, nature education, wellness, cooperation, and sustainability. Donations large and small make a lasting and significant positive impact on the environment. Invest in nature and join our growing community. Support the cause at willcountynature.org. Part of the day wings history is the Australia Army ammunition plant. Can you give us an overview of what life was like with this plant in operation? Well, it all began in 1940 when the Army came in, the government came in and started buying a property. And a total of roughly 450 property owners were affected. The arsenal actually covered approximately 40,000 acres, which is like 60 square miles. Mm -hmm. And it cost like $50 million to build, and it was all done in 10 months, which oh. is incredible. <laughs> that is. The uh, arsenal was divided into two separate sections, mm -hmm. separated by Route 53, which was Route 66 back in the day. And the west side was called the Kankakee Ordnance Works. That's where they manufactured the TNT. Okay. And this side was the Elwood Ordnance Plant, where they actually packed and loaded the bombs and shells. Okay. For delivery. So where was this ammunition kind of going? What what front was it? This is the Will County's contribution to the war effort. We're talking about World War II, later Korean War and Vietnam War. And how many people worked at the plant? I believe the maximum during World War II was around 25,000. There was even 17,000 in the peak of construction in 1940. What structure are we in front of this here? This is the ammunition storage bunker. Okay. The Army actually referred to them as igloos. Igloos. And they're, so, they're constructed to keep the temperature constant, roughly 55, 60 degrees year round. And how many bunkers are on this, this property? Or? Originally, there were approximately 390 bunkers. We're now on top of the bunker, so these are kind of underground, if you will, because they're kind of built right. into the earth. And you can see a few more, one behind us. How far apart are all these, and why are they far from each other? Well, they're 425 feet apart. They're, they, and they're staggered in case one explosion would set off a chain reaction. During the First World War, they found out the hard way, you don't want to line them up. What did it look like inside the bunkers? Is it just storage? Were there lights in there? There was no electricity allowed because the potential for a spark set off the ammunition. Sure, and then everything You don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us more about the construction of these bunkers? Yes. The bunkers are approximately 25 feet wide. They're varying lengths between 40, 60, and 80 feet. And the concrete was two feet thick in the foundation. And the arch was a foot thick and it had three feet of dirt soil on top of it. They were designed in case of an explosion to go up. And again, we're kind of on this stone trail, but it wasn't always a trail. No. This looks different. No, <clears throat> all the bunkers were serviced by a railroad. The railroad would pull right up, even with the deck here and they okay. load right out of the bunker into the train. The plan now is to start removing some of these bunkers. So what's okay. that process like? Well, first of all, they're going to have to strip all the dirt off the top. Okay. The dirt gets saved, gets reused in different places here. Okay. Nice. Um, they work with different contractors. 
Um, it goes out for bid. It's not mm -hmm. an inexpensive proposal. Mm -hmm. Basically, they have to break up the concrete. There's um, rebar and steel in the top part that gets cut and separated out from the cement. Um, and then they have to go two feet down into the ground and remove um, all the cement, so there's room for the prairie plants to grow. To start the growing. Roots. Yeah. Sounds yep. quite a process. <laughs> it is It is a process, and it takes, um, if they're cranking stuff out, mm -hmm. three to four weeks. So it's not a short amount yeah. of time, but it could take longer. It could take longer. longer. Yeah, it I was could. like, that seems about right. And when you consider some of them are 60 to 80 feet long, yeah. it's a lot of concrete, a lot of soil that we're moving. And how many are, is there going to be that are left? Or they're all going? Um, so there's that's always up for debate. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, but, but the idea is to restore the land to prairie. So there will be a few left for history's sake that okay. we can interpret. Mm -hmm. But most of them will probably be removed. We're here at a statue that's in memorial for the explosion that happened at the Arsenal plant. Can you tell us some more about that explosion? Yeah, it was about 3 a.m. June 5th, 1942. They were loading box cars with anti-tank mines and somewhere inside the building a fuse was detonated mm -hmm. and a couple seconds later the detonation carried over to all the uh, anti-tank mines and the rail cars and everything exploded. Wow. And, well there were 40, 48 people were killed. Well actually 36 were actually identified, 12 were missing. Were missing. And, and it's like 65 people injured in the blast. This is a national tall grass prairie. We've covered different habitats on the buzz before. We just did dolomite prairies. So can you describe a tall grass prairie? How is that different than your run of the mill grassland? Run of the mill <laughs> grassland, yeah. Okay, so a tall grass prairie is actually a type of grassland and it's uh, comprised of a collection of tall grasses, mm -hmm. um, many of which will reach a height of six feet or over in good productive soils. Now on Medewin, um, and in tall grass prairies in general, your wetter soils are going okay. to have things like big blue stem, little blue stem, uh, switchgrass, Indian grass, and prairie drop seed. Okay. Then when you get into our drier soils, you're going to have that little blue stem again, but you're going to have it um, coincide with things like um, different June grasses mm -hmm. or side oats grandma. Another thing with the tall grass prairie is that you're going to see a wide array of forbs and that's where you get your pops of color and color. things like that. <laughs> um, now there are way too many uh, forbs for any, any one anyone person to list, to list off. off. Right. But like, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and list more than a few for mm -hmm. you. And so we have our silphiums. So our silphiums are also going to be very tall like our grasses are going to be okay. six feet and over and you've got your compass plant, your prairie dock, your rosin weed and your cup plant. Yes. Um, okay. We actually have some compass plant. Our compass plant is what's the tallest right here. Okay. Yeah, and it's um, clearly over our heads. So it's clearly <laughs> over our heads. And I'm not six feet, but yeah. it's still really tall. Um, we've got things like our wild indigos. We have rattlesnake master you know, yeah. right here. We've got um, mountain mint. We've got blazing stars. We've got cardinal flower. Um, it's a wetter species. We have royal catchfly, which is also a species mm -hmm. of, of concern. We've got um, wild bergamot, you know, sure. our, our, a friend of the pollinator. Yes. We have our milkweeds. And um, in the fall, you'll be grateful for this. We have a myriad of asters and goldenrods. Yes. Because especially for summer lovers like me, it's like that last pop of color mm -hmm. before we go into winter. Right. So yeah, I love me, my asters Yeah, they're and my rods. favorite too. I, yes! This is my favorite oh, prairie yeah. plant, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what we got going on here. And then our, a third point, um, third and final point about a tall grass prairie mm -hmm. is that it is the type of prairie that will receive the most rainfall. So oh, your okay. three types are gonna be your short grass prairie, your mixed prairie, and then and the then tall grass, grass like here, and okay. it is the wettest. You listed off so many fun species. Now, did these plants come back on their own or is it something that we planted here or a little bit of both? Well, yes. So that is a question we get a lot. Like, did the plants come in on their own? And the answer to that is 
mostly no with a tiny, tiny bit of yes. Okay. So the reason, <laughs> the reason why I say no is because active restoration management is required mm -hmm. to restore this land back to prairie. Without active management, we would um, get a lot of those weedy non-natives that would right. take hold here. Um, and so what does this active restoration look like? It's gonna be native prairie plant plantings, mm -hmm. uh, native seed collection, and then dispersal after some seed mixing. Uh, it looks like mowing, prescribed burning, and uh, other forms of invasive species management. Now, the reason why I said there's a tiny little bit of yes is because under the soil mm -hmm. is this magical thing called a seed bank. I was gonna say, is it the yes, seed bank? Is there the seed seeds bank. hiding under there? Okay. So sometimes with the active uh, management, we're disturbing the land um, with in the right conditions mm -hmm. where we will get some of those seeds to be exposed. They germinate and they bloom. And then a surprise. We get we're a surprise back. plant. Yes. Yeah, so when some in some of our restorations, we're like, oh, look at this prairie plant we just got and it wasn't in our plantings it wasn't in our seed dispersal and so i mean it could have migrated in a different way but it's also likely that it comes from the seed bank we were talking about tall grass prairies and that's what Medewin's known for but there's more habitats than that right we do have um, a variety of other habitats here um, for example we have many wetlands mm -hmm. um, so you know marshes things like that we have um, and wet prairies uh, we have the Dolomite Prairie, which is the uh, one of the rarest uh, natural communities in North America. Um, we also have a Sand Prairie, which is um, our Sand Ridge uh, restoration. We have our riparian areas. We have uh, various types of grassland habitat mm -hmm. that wouldn't technically be a prairie. And we also have uh, small amounts of woodland habitat as well that not many people know okay. about. No, I did not know. So you have a little bit of everything. We do. We, <laughs> it was a little bit of everything. You know, it's good. So with all this biodiversity, of course, more biodiversity in plants bring more animals and wildlife. And I hear Medewin is quite a hot spot for birds. You want to give us kind of an overview of what I think is one of your favorite things yes. is birding. Yes. Uh, well, <laughs> animals in general are my favorite sure. thing. But um there are so many birds here it's a birder's paradise um Midewin, it has actually over 200 species of birds that utilize Midewin as actual habitat and of those species we uh, suspect 113 as breeders okay so um that is incredibly important because if they're not breeding we're not getting any more birds sure um one of my favorite grassland birds, mm -hmm. as well as a summer breeder here, is the bobolink. So I've never seen one. No, I, I know. Oh you my haven't. Gosh, we need in. to find one. Call one in. Oh, I can't call one in, <laughs> and I'll tell you why I can't call it in. Please so do. So this is one of one of my favorite <laughs> birds. And next year, come back in June. Okay, I will. So it's the breeding male that makes the song. Mm -hmm. um, and they they just sound like a very happy bird. But the sound to me is unique because it sounds like a happy robot. Okay. So if you can imagine the happiest robot I can, in existence. I can, but I feel like you need but, to do it for us. Oh, I can't. It's like, <laughs> you can't. I'd have to play it for you because it, it's just mechanical. It's okay. mechanical, but high pitched and very just flighty mm -hmm. and, you know, like does that. Like energizing. Energizing. So you instantly, like you instantly get happy. I've had like, ornithologists when we do our grass mm -hmm. and bird surveys they come and they're like it's one of my favorite birds because it just makes me feel so it happy makes you feel happy and, and yes yeah, so it's, it's this happy robot and you just you get a big smile on your face instantly and your eyes probably get just as big as your smile <laughs> because you're scanning the tops of the grass the grasses he want they, they really like grassland right and the, uh, about medium length and and they'll fly and they, they do this kind of flighty thing like this and um in june that's what i'm telling you okay, in june, that's the height. like early mm -hmm. june you're gonna not just see the one they're always like it's a group of like three or four cool and um so they're doing that call and it just makes you really happy we've got so many other grassland species and just other bird species in general so we have grasshopper sparrows we have dick sissels we okay. have savannah sparrows sedge wrens um the eastern meadowlark which is actually mm -hmm. that nice chonky bird yeah that's on all our pamphlets. it's on the posters yeah and it, it's always <laughs> singing proud and it's got that that one i can do it's oh let's hear it that one is really easy to do. 
Now you mentioned different times of the year, a lot of different species. If you're a birder and want to see some of these things, what do you recommend? So for most, most of those grassland birds I mm -hmm. mentioned, you want to come between, um, well they come in as early as, as April, but they're getting real active and stuff late May, June. You still okay. see them in, um, in July and August, but that really rush of activity would have been, been late May and, and um, into like migration June. migration season kind of thing. Okay. And we do have obviously that spring migration and fall mm -hmm. migration, so you're going to get birds that I didn't even list because yeah. they're passing through, yeah. but they still technically utilize midday one habitat because they have to stop here to rest. Stop and eat. They stop and eat, mm -hmm. just various things, but they might not be breeding here. Sure. If you are a new person to Medewin and it's a large property, <laughs> where should they start? What's your favorite trail or a good place to see things? So if you are a visitor and you want to be in the prairie and see the prairie mm -hmm. as fast as possible, mm -hmm. not a lot of walking, sure. I would recommend that Iron Bridge uh, Prairie Restoration okay. accessible via the Iron Bridge Trailhead mm -hmm. because it's the parking lot and you walk a few feet and the prairie's and right there. there. Remember prairie is absent or mostly absent of trees. So not a lot of shade and yeah, not a lot of- need your hat that day. <laughs> not a lot of people want to walk in the sun on a hot summer day for a long period of time. I've experienced this multiple times here at Medewin and just in any natural space. It's, you know, you're, you're walking or you're working if you're, you're in our field and it's that moment that you're actually present. Mm -hmm. Like you literally, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I, I just had this either close encounter with an animal species or Everything I see and everything I hear is nature and you're, you're so present and all your other racing thoughts leave you and it leaves you, it literally puts you in awe and it's like so loud but deafening at the same time. Mm -hmm. I think if everybody got to experience that, that moment. Yeah. there would be so much more value on nature. It, it, it's literally one of the quickest ways to be put in peace. Yeah, you know, just being that restore. And, and I've gotten that in many places here on Medewin. Medewin National Tallgrass Prairie is the largest piece of protected open space in northeastern Illinois. There's so much to explore, we've just scratched the surface. So make sure to tune in next month as we continue the tour of the land. In the meantime, map your next adventure here at Medewin. Visit the Welcome Center or explore the Medewin app. I hope to see you in the tall grasses, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.